My name is John Davis. Uh, I'm the uh, director of the Strand Group at King's College London, and a very warm welcome to you all to our lovely new building. This is the 26th Strand Group, and uh, they've all been sponsored by Hewlett Packard. We, we now go under the name DXC Technology, but a very big thank you uh, for all that they do for us. Tonight, uh, we've got a really special one uh, to launch uh, what we if you were up early enough this morning, you would have heard the uh, ding-dong battle on the uh, Today programme. Uh, the uh, launch of the Harvard Working Paper, Time for Clarity, the Views of British Business on the Path to Brexit. And we're very fortunate to have such a wonderful panel this evening. Uh, we've got our visiting professor, Ed Balls. Uh, we've got Peter Sands, incoming executive director of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. And then from a business point of view, we've got Will Atkinson, uh, MD and publisher at Atlantic Books. We've got Katie Doherty, uh, policy director at the International Meat Trade Association. Isaac Watson, techni technical manager, Martin's Rubber Company Limited. We have Sue Davis, strategic policy advisor of which, and we have our great friend John Mills, chairman of JML. The way that it's going to work is that I'm going to ask Ed to say a few words. We'll pass over to Peter, back to Ed. Then we'll come through to the business. Uh, we'll have uh, the consumer view. Then we'll ask some questions. God, we're going to get through it. OK, Ed, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to, uh, to John and to the Strand Group for having us back uh, again. This is the second in the series of papers that um, Peter and I have um, done with Harvard and with King's over the last year and a half. And we've done it um, uh, as research um, fellows at the Kendi School at Harvard with four graduate students, two of whom are here, um, and the Asher who graduated last year uh, with an MPP at the Kendi School, um, Eleanor who's doing a PhD here at King's, and then two uh, students who can't be with us because they're actually over at Harvard at the moment, um, Seb and Mehet who are doing their um, MPPs over there. Peter came up with the insight um, at the beginning of this process a year and a half ago, which is that... Um, we weren't hearing very much from the business viewpoint following the, the referendum in 2016. There was uh, lots of issues about how Brexit would be implemented. And um, but I think after the referendum, and maybe because of the way the referendum was conducted and the, uh, the rules around the Electoral Commission and those kind of things, the business view um, was heard less. And so we decided that we would go out and um, do a large qualitative um, research project talking to small and medium-sized businesses in particular about um, their issues um, with the Brexit process, what they wanted from the end state, um, what they thought about the transition, the issues which particularly were of concern to them. We published that um, last June, the Monday after the uh, general uh, election, uh, at a time where it was very interesting. The BBC um, said to us a few days before that they had heard very little from either main political party about business uh, and very little from the business community during the election. And, um, but it actually then sparked a period where I think there's been much more debate uh, since then. And um, we decided uh, in August we would do a second paper um, and see how things had changed. And so we've, um, after the 50 companies we did in the first half of last year, uh, we've interviewed a further 80 companies and trade associations um, with a very wide range of um, geography, but also different sectors, uh, to try and get a sample which is not... Um, we wouldn't claim that it was a statistically representative sample, but it's an interesting, qualitative, broad uh, sample. And um, uh, because we've done detailed, one-hour-long, in-depth interviews with everyone of the business uh, community and trade association, it's very interesting for us to pick up the common themes, but also to see how these issues have developed. And I'm going to hand over to Peter to um, tell you what we found out in our second survey over the last six months. Okay. <coughs> Thanks, Ed. And I'm coming up here not because um, I have massive things to do with all this technology, but because I have the grand total of one slide, and the only way I can control it is from... Um, uh, here. And I will actually start with my first slide. Um, in, in the majority of the interviews, um, but 
not all, because for various reasons we ran out of time or people didn't want to do it or the conversation went on for different things. Um, we asked the businesses to just tell us how important they thought the various issues are. And um, so it's not statistical at all, but it, again, it's an interesting sort of illumination of what's on people's minds. And this is, this is what we heard in terms of, we asked them to rank it um, on a one to five scale, um, score it on a one to five scale, and here they are in the order of the mean um, uh, scores. Uh, what is very striking is the emphasis on um, labor and skills. Uh, on the labour market issues. And I would say that was completely um, correlated with the, all the interviews we were doing across all sorts of different sectors, size of companies. There was a huge focus on the labour market's issues. Um, second, unsurprisingly, um, um, significant focus on continued membership of the single market. Third, and this is much more than in our first round of interviews, um, transition arrangements. Um, businesses generally welcomed the concept of having a transition, transition period, but are now asking a huge number of questions about how exactly will it work. Um, then, and I won't go through all of them, but the next couple, um, continued participation in EU regulatory agencies. I'm afraid that's come off the um, slide. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, there are something like 35 different specialists EU regulatory agencies, and as individual companies have thought through um, the implications of Brexit, they've become very focused on what actually is happening with those agents, agencies, because they play a very critical role, not just in administrating, um, administering the regulatory frameworks, but in evolving them and actually providing technical assistance as well. And we're talking here about things like EASA, EMA, Euratom, there's a whole bunch of these different um, agencies. So what did we find from the interviews? Um, and uh, again, this is very qualitative. There were lots of very divergent views. Um, uh, there were some things where there appeared to be a very strong set of consensus, but a lot of things where people ha had very different perspectives. Um, so one of the challenges of this research was to kind of distill what we saw as the core messages. So what were they? Um, first is, we were struck by the fact that British companies now are recognised that securing an FTA that gives access to the single market is not the same thing as being in the single market and is significantly inferior. And that is materially different from when we did um, our interviews um, uh, a year ago. People's, people's understanding of the distinction of an FTA giving access and being a member in terms of the regulatory harmonization the, and particularly the impact for services businesses, very, very different. A second big finding um, was that an overwhelming majority of those interviewees who expressed an opinion wanted to stay in the customs union. There were some who didn't express an opinion, typically service companies, um, for whom the customs union wasn't a sort of concept that often meant much to them because it doesn't make much difference. Um, but for most of the others, have sort of come to the conclusion that the benefits of leaving the customs union, which allows the UK to negotiate trade deals elsewhere in the world, were more than offset by the added frictional costs of having customs checks around rules of origin, tariffs, and so on, and a sense that maybe the UK wasn't likely to get as good or better deals than the EU was capable <coughs> of getting anyway. And relevant to that, um, if you look at UK exports, um, about 60, 61, 62% of it is going to countries that are either in the EU, in the EEA, or to places with which um, the EU already has an FTA. If you're looking at the balance of sort of 38 percentage, roughly half of it is the US, and the rest of the world is the other half. Um, and we had a lot of conversations about the US market, 
And many companies are enormously excited about the US. Um, it's a hugely important market for many British companies. Um, but actually, they were pretty skeptical about both the potential benefits of an FTA or the likelihood of it happening. Um, the reason for the skepticism about the benefits is that tariffs with um, the US are already pretty low, about 2.5% on average, um, and that many of the opportunities are in services where the expectation of massive market opening, people were more, more often not quite skeptical about. And then general skepticism about whether or not, given the sort of political dynamics on both sides of the Atlantic, this was actually something that could be pulled off um, anytime soon. And then lastly on trade, we saw, um, um, uh, we heard a much more crystallized view around a hard Brexit, a leaving um, without a deal and reverting to WTO terms. Our sense was that companies now had a much better, on the whole, a much better grip on the implications of that and therefore um, uh, didn't like it, frankly. That um, were most people, most of the people we spoke to thought it was a pretty bad idea. On, on regulation, um, we basically heard confirmation of what we had heard the first time around, which is although many businesses would start the conversation with having a little rant about um, how regulation was too costly and burdensome, when we actually got into the specifics of the regulation affecting their own businesses, most uh, businesses we spoke to were actually, to our surprise, remarkably satisfied with the broad frameworks in which they um, operated um, and, and didn't actually see a huge opportunity on Brexit for a massive change or regulation uh, in regulation or tailoring to British circumstances. Indeed, what we heard more often was a concern that now we would end up having to conform to two sorts of regulation. We would have the EU stuff because we're still doing business in the EU, but we would also have to do um, the UK stuff um, if it were different. And linked to that was the point I made earlier about um, involvement and engagement in the specialised <coughs> agencies. Um, a lot of companies are very concerned about, so if you're in the pharma or biotech industry, what's going to happen to the EMA? Um, how is their thinking and standards going to change? Because frankly, Europe as a whole is more important to a biotech company than the UK is. And so those regulations are going to be enormously <coughs> important. And then uh, more recently, of course, with the, um, the phase one agreement and the agreement on alignment of regulations between the North and the South in Ireland to the extent that they affect the Good Friday Agreement. We heard some businesses saying, what exactly does that mean? Um, and you know, what are the implications of that for any scope for um, regulatory divergence? Skills and talent, this was the one where right across the board, we, we heard um, deep expressions of concern and a general scepticism and sense that one of the toughest tasks of the government would be to devise a workable immigration scheme that actually both met the political imperatives and also met the very diverse needs of business for different sorts of skill. Um, and we had a lot of smaller companies saying it's all very well if you're a big company and you've got an HR department who can manage all these processes. <laughs> But if you're a smaller company and you need people flexibly on a project basis, how is that going to um, work? We talked to, to um, our interviews about funding and subsidies. What was interesting there is that most of the companies we talked to, including people um, in the agribusinesses, um, thought that the government would, broadly speaking, have to keep roughly the same level of funding and subsidies um, as uh, has been channeled to the industries through the EU. So the level of savings from that was unlikely to be um, great. Now, we've got, to, we've got to put the caveat there, which is that, of course, these businesses who were receiving them would hope that would be the case um, uh, very naturally. Um, transition. Transition um, was something that was just a sort of uh, a very kind of a, a worry about potential cliff edges when we talked to businesses um, a year ago. Um, people's thinking about transition has moved dramatically. A, people are very aware of the, the idea of the transition period, 
but they're also now beginning to ask very, very granular questions of what does it actually mean? Will it be exactly the same or will there be things that are different? And particularly the issue of um, third party countries and deals with third party countries and how they will be affected by the transition is beginning to get, people are beginning to get their minds around. The, the point here being that the EU and the UK can make an agreement that after March the 29th, 2019, that everything will stay the same, even though the UK has left the EU. But there are an awful lot of agreements, several hundred agreements out there, which with other countries, which apply to EU member states or companies domiciled in EU member states or to EU citizens. And it is not, the fact that the e UK and the EU have agreed that things will stay the same is not binding on those other um, countries. And people are now, only now really beginning to get their heads around what does that actually mean? And is this transition period actually going to be a different type of complexity um, that they're going to encounter? So what's our um, conclusion? Um, our con key conclusion from these interviews is unambiguous, that most British business leaders believe that the current path of Brexit could cause significant damage to their businesses, both because the end point will inevitably mean more barriers to trade, more like, most likely more regulation, and almost certainly less influence over the regulations that affect them, and because the process of leaving the EU is creating huge uncertainties and diverting management attention. We can have huge debates about the magnitude of that, but I think what came clear to us is that businesses were very quick to point to problems they could identify arising from this process. They found it very hard to identify many significant opportunities that made their lives um, easier. I'll just close with a couple of um, um, uh, other observations. Um, first was a sense we heard that right now is kind of a watershed. Up to the end of the year, people were looking ahead to 2018, and in fact, in 2018, nothing was going to change. Now, businesses are beginning to ch um, put their focus on 2019, and they know that in March, end of March 2019, things will change. So there's a sense of real realism and urgency here, and this is why we entitled this thing a time for clarity, because businesses are having to make decisions now. Um, a second thing that struck us, and it was hard to kind of capture in a, in a very concrete fashion, was a lot of the business leaders we talked to spoke about a shift in psychology or sentiment towards Europe and from Europe towards the UK. A sense of insularity, a sense of um, maybe not wanting to get as engaged in partnerships. Um, and, and you can see that because the rules of engagement are, are so um, uncertain. But they talked about that very much in sort of psychological and, and cultural terms within their companies. But I'd close by saying it would be wrong to say that the businesses we spoke to were invariably gloomy. Many of them were talking about all sorts of problems, but then they would kind of end the interview by saying, but, you know, we'll just focus on it, we'll adapt, we'll respond, we'll make the best of it, we'll work it out. And so there was a sense of sort of resilience and adaptability um, that came through um, a lot of the conversations we had. So I'll close there and hand back to you, Ed. So we, um, the project didn't ask any of the business leaders what um, their view of the referendum in 2016 uh, was. We don't know whether people were for or against Brexit. We didn't ask. Uh, the project was about how you make a success of Brexit and how people currently feel the Brexit, that Brexit process is working. And for that reason as well, uh, we didn't get into any party politics because... Um, you can find somebody in any party who agrees with you um, on Brexit at the moment, whatever your point of view is. And so actually party politics is a rather complex lens to look at this through. Um, but we did have um, a lot of comments from the businesses we interviewed about the way in which the political process is working and making life more complicated for them. And I guess um, there was probably four different things we heard regularly, which you could call... Uh, could call um, Mixed messages, uh, have your cake and eat it, um, uh, stand off and brinkmanship. Uh, the mixed messages, which we heard regularly, was people saying it's really hard to know where we're going because different people say different
different things and contradictory things. And uh, of course, that is true at the, the moment. It's, it's hard in government when you have a period of uh, argument and, div and division before you make a decision. <coughs> we all lived through that when we were making the decision about the euro. Between 1997 and 2003, there was a lot of argument and um, differences of view in the cabinet. And then a decision was made and people, uh, and people came around it. The complication in, in this process is that the decision was made really before the cabinet had discussed it. And therefore, Theresa May as prime minister inherited a decision. And we're sort of debating through still um, within, within the government and more widely in our politics, um, what we think of a decision we've already made. And that is just a rather more complicating uh, time. The second thing we heard a lot of was people saying um, they think they can have their cake and eat it. I think businesses get particularly frustrated when they hear people say we can have um, a free trade agreement which allows us to negotiate our new trade deals around the world outside the customs union, but we will also have frictionless trade, we won't have tariff barriers, and we'll have an open border between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. Because businesses say, but that's completely impossible, uh, and how can you say these contradictory things, which is obviously frustrating. Um, I think business gets frustrated at the moment with the sort of, um, the sort of standoff in the negotiation. Um, best exemplified probably by Mrs Merkel's comments a couple of weeks ago. Of her saying to the Prime Minister, um, what do you want? The Prime Minister saying, but what are you offering? And what do you want? <laughs> and that sort of rolls along. And then I th the other thing which we heard a lot of was brinkmanship, which is that you, know, um, that you say we're not going to concede on... Northern Ireland, uh, sorry, uh, 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 on the Northern Ireland border or on uh, the rights of EU citizens or on the budget until the last moment when you do. So I guess the thing which came out of our um, interviews from many of the people we spoke to, hence the title Time for Clarity, is that people would ideally like the mixed messages to end and the cabinet discussions in the coming weeks to reach a, you know, a relatively unified view, a view which people could uh, understand and, uh, and come around. And they would rather that, you know, subject to a negotiation, because it is a negotiation, for the government to be able to set out a bit more clearly in some key areas what we're trying to achieve in a way which feels uh, consistent. So that's what people would like. Um, I guess what they are expecting is that for a period more, we'll carry on with um, standoff. And then the question that they don't know is whether we'll end up with brinkmanship <coughs> or we will end up with something worse. And brinkmanship would mean that you hold to hard positions, potentially contradictory positions, until the end game, and then you reach an agreement. And I think business would find that very difficult because it's very hard to plan, but at least you would know where you are at the end. And that has been the revealed preference of the negotiation in the last uh, year. At each stage, until the end, it wasn't clear that it became clear. I think the things which we heard business is particularly worrying about was that in the end, this time, rather than brinkmanship, we end up with, um, with a, a non-agreement. And a non-agreement would either be defaulting onto WTO terms, and the one thing which was common across pretty much all of our interviews, that a hard Brexit based upon a reversion to WTO without an agreement is very, very difficult indeed. And of course, the other destabilising possibility is that the government tries to make a deal and then is defeated in Parliament, which is also uh, chaotic. So I think the one thing which we heard from the businesses we spoke to was, you know, please do it more quickly, but what we would like is a unified strategy from the government which we can understand, and for you to do that sooner rather than later so that we can start to plan. Um, I think that's a fair description of the, 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 the political advice which we received from the businesses we interviewed. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we need to hear from business. Uh, can, I, can I pass over to Will of Atlantic Books? Uh, good evening, Ron. Um, uh, the, uh, I can, I'm speaking on behalf of obviously Atlantic Books and probably publishing some of the publishing industry and possibly even the creative industries as well. Uh, the English language is the largest language in the world. Uh, we have about 1.6 billion uh, regular speakers. Uh, there are 1.1 billion Chinese, but there isn't much of a diaspora uh, in terms of the Chinese language. And then the Spanish down at 800 million. Uh, we had a very effective empire for 300 years, which meant a lot of people ended up speaking English, and then we gave over to the Americans uh, for the next 100 years. So it, it, if we seem to be turning our backs uh, on that global uh, rich connectivity, 
uh, and seem to be insular, uh, turning on ourselves, then the long-term effect of our ability to uh, float along, if you like, on the English language is in peril. So in the very, very macro uh, version of this, we want the English language to, con to continue to grow uh, and to be seen as the, the lingua franca, I use that in a sort of, sort of knowing way. Uh, um, uh, and so the, by the end of this, we still want uh, the, everyone around the world uh, to be talking English as either as a second language or indeed the first, uh, and seeing the English uh, language coming out of England and Britain uh, as something that's uh, only set to continue. Um, we, uh, 10 years ago, uh, there was a stat which said that one, uh, 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 every German, um, or one, in one, one in six of every, every German uh, read or um, read an English book or an English newspaper once a week. Uh, and now it's almost uh, entirely um, uh, bilingual. So the English language has uh, really taken uh, an extraordinary place in the, in, in, in the state of Germany. Um, the English uh, publishing industry is an export-driven uh, uh, business. Uh, we sell more uh, to uh, customers than uh, ourselves. Um, some of that uh, comes from the academic uh, institutes and research, uh, and that is where the large amount of the growth is happening. Uh, guess what? A lot of that acad academia and research is being funded by Europe. So we've got this rather lovely, beautiful cycle that we're in, uh, in terms of money coming from the EU, jobs in the EU, and then us being able to sell uh, across the world based on that. Um, we have world-class academic uh, institutions again, uh, which feed off uh, a real extraordinary brand uh, for Britain again, floated along by the English language. It doesn't really help us uh, to say, well, we can make new uh, friends um, around the world because we already export much more um, uh, to the, the out, outside world than we do to Europe. So being able to compete in Europe uh, is, as we can at the moment, is the thing that we want to protect. Uh, tariffs, friction, as I'm sure there'll be a lot, a, a lot more of that, but that's, uh, certainly we are in a very, very good position now. We have to compete with the Americans, uh, because often we don't, we have, we're selling the same books into Europe uh, as the Americans. We don't have uh, exclusive uh, territory there, certainly on the trade side. So uh, again, we're desperate uh, to have that as frictionless as possible. At the moment, we have good advantages uh, over the American uh, competition, and we don't want that uh, to stop. Um, Europe has also been a fantastic protector of the creative industries. Um, last year, they took, up, took on Amazon. Amazon had been behaving illegally over MFN clauses, most favored nation clauses for five years. I sat in a, in a room with a whole bunch of Amazon lawyers saying, this is illegal. You're doing, you're doing this, and sure enough, three years later, they were stopped doing it. Not by the European, not, not by the British government. That would never have happened in a million years, but by the European Commission. So they understand um, regulation, and certainly supranational bodies are going to be needed uh, to, to um, regulate uh, certainly copyrights, intellectual property, and these things which are so kind of quite slithery, if you like. Um, and certainly we we find ourselves much more comfortable as being part of a European uh, body uh, rather than fighting it out on our own. Similarly, European uh, governments have been much stronger around uh, issues like copyright, intellectual property, where we've often felt sometimes that the British government have left us to our own devices, but certainly the French and the Germans are very, very strong in this, and then obviously as the powerhouses of, uh, of the European Commission, we're very, very keen uh, to remain certainly in that environment. Um, so uh, we'll talk, we can talk about tariffs, but certainly um, probably the last thing I'll say because I haven't got much time is that really what uh, on the trade side, the books, bookshops and uh, uh, people buying books to read, if you like, certainly consumer confidence is really, really important. Uh, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a booming industry and doing well, export driven, uh, but certainly the home market again is extremely important. So uh, physical books have only just started uh, growing again and therefore uh, a collapse in consumer confidence will be very, very uh, desperate and dangerous. So we want certainty uh, and we want clarity around, around transition. I'll probably leave it there. Well, what's your point, uh, what's your thinking on the customs on this? Uh, to be honest, I don't, we, 
we prefer to stay in because we, 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 we don't think we'll get a better deal outside of it. Thank you. Thank you. And the International Wheat Trade Association. Good evening. Um, just to provide you with a little bit of context, as a trade association, we represent both importers and exporters of beef, lamb, pork and poultry meat. And we're rather a unique sector in the fact that we have a product which is disassembled and you have to find a market for all the different parts, including the feet. Um, in, in the UK market, um, our consumers prefer things like chicken breasts, lamb legs, steaks, but everything has a market around the world and therefore trade is absolutely critical for our sector. Uh, we're also unique in sort of two Brexit-related kind of concerns, one being tariffs, where often we hear quoted that the average MFN tariff is only 3 to 4%. But in meat, if you look at the EU MFN duty, that's, that can equate to 50 or 60%. So that's a particular concern for UK sheep meat exporters to the EU, um, because that's a significant amount. And the other thing is on border checks. So not customs checks, we have a unique sort of question for our sector, which is around veterinary checks. So at the moment, meat moves as easily from Scotland to London as it does Italy to London. Um, but for non-EU imports, they face veterinary checks at the, port of in at the uh, border inspection post at the point of import. So a vet will actually stop the consignment, they'll open up some cartons, they will potentially send some of that meat to a laboratory for testing. And when you're talking about chilled poultry meat with a 10-day shelf life, if, if, for example, there was um, veterinary checks in between the EU and the UK, you can see that that could be a big issue if it's gone to a lab and it takes more than a week for that, that sample to come back. Um, and our consumers in the UK have uh, become used to um, having chilled, just-in-time products. And we aren't self-sufficient, and it's not viable for us to be self-sufficient. We do need both domestic, robust domestic production, um, import, a choice of imported sources of supply, particularly on chilled um, kind of poultry meats, you need to sort of look to your neighbours for um, meeting the UK consumers' demand for the chilled product. But we also need export markets for the parts of the carcass that UK consumers don't have a preference for. So I would actually argue that the meat sector has could be one of the most impacted by Brexit. And we have some serious kind of infrastructural questions that need answering. Um, so certainly we are keen on having some, some certainty um, fairly soon, um, because particularly for SMEs within our association, it's pretty difficult for them to plan their businesses with, do they face 50 to 60% additional tariff, or is it the same as it is now? So tariff-free access, and also dealing with that question of veterinary checks um, within the EU and the, uh, the UK. So that, those are our kind of key points. Thank you very much. Over to Isaac of Marvin's Runner. Good evening all. So uh, Martin's Rubber, we're a rubber manufacturer who specialise in the production and supply of elastomeric products. So things like seals, gaskets, rubber mouldings, um, in specialised polymers, uh, engineering plastics, that kind of thing, gasketing materials. Um, we're quite an old company, but a small family-run business, so founded in 1865, 150 years of trade history there. Um, but uh, as I said, family-run business, so we employ around 50 people uh, of various nationalities. Um, our customers range from various sectors, uh, aerospace, defence, motorsport, things like F1 parts, um, various engineering, manufacturing and energy markets, uh, to nuclear industry, for example, and chemistry, uh, chemical uh, industries as well. Um, in supply to these sectors, we regularly undertake, undertake a review of all the relevant uh, regulations and all the strict specifications that they apply. Um, the main concerns for our company are, uh, as mentioned in paper twofold, uh, what will become of uh, EU and foreign uh, employees based in the UK, both current and prospective? What will happen on future access available, availability of skilled or well-motivated uh, non-UK labour? Um, also, how will the UK interact at a macroeconomic level with the single EU market? And in terms of regulation, how will this change over the next few years? 
we face an issue right now that uh, the rubber industry is uh, often overlooked as a, as a material supply. Um, not fully understood, perhaps. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, regulation in place on plastics for many years, and they're regularly in the spotlight, but rubbers are much less understood, but in some cases much more complex. Um, and it appears to us that uh, just as we're getting close to harmonization, uh, we're facing divergence in the uh, regulation industry, uh, in the regulation of this industry. And this is not only in um, sectors such as energy, but in particular food safe seals, H4 water, for example. And these are real issues which, you know, um, seals for these kind of applications take at times two years to develop and approve. And we're already on the back foot in terms of what we're going to do next. Are we going to take a, a bit of a, 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 a risky stance and do a proactive development, for example, or are we going to maintain our reactive stance to customer-driven uh, developments? And so without much guidance as to what's going to happen next, it's hard to take that, uh, take that leap of faith almost into... Uh, secure in future business uh, in these sectors. Thank you very much indeed. John. Uh, thank you very much. Is the microphone working? Yes. It is. Um, I'm in a slightly uh, unusual position compared to other people on the uh, panel here for a number of reasons. Uh, one is I was very much involved with the referendum. I ran the Labour end of the Leave uh, campaign. Um, the second is that uh, my day job is as chairman of a company which uh, sells to, I think, 85 countries at the last count and moves about 2,000 containers a year all over the world. So I've got a more, probably more of an idea about what's actually involved in foreign trade than, 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 than many other people have. The third is that I had a, a meeting with Michel Barnier, the um, EU negotiator, recently with a very small delegation. So that was actually very key in giving me an insight as to where I think things are going to finish up. And fourthly, I have to apologise for the fact that I was co-opted onto this panel at very short notice. And I'm going to have to slip away at about 7.30, so please forgive me for that. But going back to what uh, is going to happen, uh, I think, in fact, the choice that uh, we're facing over the next coming uh, year or so uh, is that we're going to finish up with a pretty binary choice about what we do about uh, the way these negotiations are going. I think if we, uh, and this really comes out as much as anything else of the experience I had with uh, Michel Barnier. I mean, his focus is on maintaining the security and integrity of the single market. He's not particularly punitive as far as we're concerned, but, uh, you know, we're relatively irrelevant to his considerations. And I think the other really important thing to realise about the European Union is that the politics of the EU are much more important to most of the leadership there than the economics. So the idea that just because we've got a big balance of payments deficit with the EU that uh, the German car manufacturers and French wine producers are all going to lean on the politicians to be accommodating, I think is a risky strategy which may well not pay off. But if th what I'm saying is correct, I think what we're going to finish up with is uh, not what I think most people in this country would want, which is some kind of uh, deal where we're outside the European Union, but effectively pretty well uh, I inside it in regulatory terms, but with quite a bit of derogation. I don't think that's likely to happen. I think we're going to have to more or less accept the whole of the acquis and the uh, regulations of the single market and the customs union, even if we're nominally outside all of them as one option or if these negotiations break down, we're going to finish up by having some sort of WTO-type deal, uh, possibly with the uh, uh, import duties that are still in place, but hopefully with some sort of free trade element to it, so that at least as far as goods are concerned, they'd be duty-free. Uh, how far we get with services, I think, remains to be seen. But I think the impact on, of all this on businesses is that it's very easy to overestimate how much of a trauma this is going to be for most businesses. I appreciate there are some special ones like meat and uh, other ones too where the situation is very much more critical. But for most businesses, uh, selling goods to the European Union 
whether you do it as uh, members of the single market with free movement or whether you do it as not members of the single market but still available to sell that, possibly over tariffs and possibly not, doesn't make a huge difference to the way the whole uh, market uh, situation uh, it, it develops. I mean, the tariffs, even if we were finished up with WTO terms, are about 2.5% on average on industrial goods. I mean, they are relatively low. The customs procedure changes are really relatively insignificant. Uh, there's slightly more complication because of, of uh, rules of origin and uh, the customs procedures are slightly more complicated. But with the way that uh, uh, international movements of, of goods are going with um, trusted traders and pre-clearance and all this sort of thing, the AEO system, the, the, the difficulty of, of, of getting uh, containers through the customs is really very limited. And it's interesting to look at the border, for example, between Canada and the United States. Uh, where really the, 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 there's a huge amount of trade between the two countries uh, and the border is really pretty frictionless, so it shows that it can be done. So I think the message that I'm really trying to get across is that actually, although I can well understand why businesses feel uh, uh, apprehensive about the changes that are coming up, and I also very well understand that they are concerned about uh, uncertainty, I think in the end, the amount of difference that it's all going to make to them is going to be relatively limited. And certainly as far as the business that I, you know, I'm involved in is concerned, we're relatively optimistic that one way or another uh, there will be opportunities, there will be some costs, but that in the end of the day it won't make a huge difference. And that actually what is much more important is the sort of policies pursued uh, in the economy as a whole to get it to grow. Uh, I don't think it's likely to... Uh, lead to the economy dipping right down any more than that did before. I think it'll just go on growing relatively slowly and businesses will continue to prosper or not, as, as the case may be, uh, very much as they have done up till now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I have the microphone across here? Uh, now here from Sue Overwich. Thank you. Well, thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to contribute to the debate. Um, which was neutral in the referendum, and our focus is on making sure that we get the best outcome from Brexit for consumers. Um, I was pleased to be able to contribute to the survey because I think consumer confidence is obviously absolutely crucial to the success of businesses and the economy, and ultimately what happens from Brexit. But consumers haven't really been much of the debate at all, and consumer interests, we feel, have been neglected by government up till now. I wanted to highlight three particular issues which we think are really crucial in terms of the outcomes that are needed for consumers and the way that consumers will judge whether or not what's achieved is successful in terms of our future relationship with the EU. Um, the first one is obviously in relation to prices. Um, we've heard from the report that there was a lot of focus on free and frictionless trade with the EU and any tariffs that are introduced or any additional um, burdensome administrative costs or border controls will quickly um, feed through to consumers through higher prices. If you take food, for example, which Kate has obviously already talked about, 30% of our food comes from the EU at the moment. We produce about 50% domestically. Um, if we were in a WTO-type scenario, the average tariff for that would be much higher than the average tariffs. It would be about 22% based on the British Retail Consortium's research, but going up to about 60%, obviously, for some products like meat. Um, the UK TPO, a UK Trade Policy Observatory with the Resolution Foundation, did some interesting work, which you've probably seen, in terms of how that transmits through into consumer prices. And it's obviously very difficult to do, and they were saying it's a very conservative estimate because it didn't take into account currency rates or non-tariff barriers. But they reckon that a, 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 <coughs> excuse me, a tariff of about 30% would result in about an 8% increase in actual consumer prices. So it's something that is significant. We have a... Um, regular consumer tracker where we track consumer worry about different issues. And we've seen over the last year that there's been a steady increase in consumer concern about food prices from about 50% a year ago to about 60% now, which probably reflects the, the currency effects. Um, but it's obviously an important issue. From that tracker as well, we know that the top concern for people overall 
is generally um, energy prices. And obviously at the moment we have a relationship with the EU where we have flexible energy supplies through the interconnectors and that maintains security of supply. So that's another area where we feel that we need to make sure that we've got a clear agreement on what the future relationship and trading um, situation is going to be. And then the third example I wanted to give as well is obviously um, in relation to flights, where we're part of the European Common Aviation Area. We've got used to cheap flights to EU destinations, but also EU um, airlines coming to the UK to then go on to North America and to other parts of the world that mean that we've got incredible choice of cheap flights now. So that's obviously something that has to be priority in, in terms of sorting it out. I think it's easy to think of consumers and think that consumers care about prices, uh, and prices always dominate, but from the research that we've been doing and which we'll be publishing soon, it's clear that people just have really strong expectations about safety and quality standards. It's quite interesting when we've talked about product safety and we've talked about food issues, that there's almost an unquestioning faith that, of course, we will maintain standards, and if anything, maybe those standards will get even better. Um, so I think it was interesting seeing the survey and what business has said about regulation, where I think sometimes you hear that there's a view that there's lots of red tape that we can get rid of. There's some really important questions that need to be addressed about the underpinning infrastructure, which um, pe some people have already picked up on. So at the moment where we've got relationships with some of the EU agencies, that's obviously important for consumer protection as well. So what are we going to do and how are we going to create that at UK level? And the whole consumer enforcement regime, where at the moment we're reliant on trading standards which are steadily um, disintegrating in some parts of the country, and yet we're going to have to have all these border controls in place, potentially, to make sure that consumers can have confidence in the safety and quality. And then there's the big issue about trade deals, obviously, and making sure that safety and quality standards, which are so central to consumer confidence and therefore business success, ultimately, aren't traded away as part of deals, whether that's food safety or, or other aspects. And then the final point I wanted to make was in relation to consumer rights, which I think is an area that people don't really think about unless they actually need those rights. Um, I don't think that's probably a risk in terms of what's going to happen to domestic legislation because we've had a lot of influence over the consumer rights um, legislation at EU level. And in some aspects, we've gone further. But we've got really used to buying across borders, to online shopping. We buy lots of things from other parts of the EU. Amazon's based in Luxembourg, for example. Um, at the moment, we have consumer rights. We've got reciprocal arrangements. If something goes wrong, if something's faulty, we can get that sorted out. If our flight's cancelled or delayed, we can get that sorted out. We've got health care um, and for access when we're travelling in the EU as well. So it's those kinds of rights that I think we can easily take for granted that we think also have to be... Um, prominent in the discussions around the future relationship. Thank you. Thank you very much. Peter? Yeah. Um, first of all, I just want to thank um, all the panellists for those contributions. I think um, the audience will get a sense not only of um, the diversity of views we encountered in our interviews, but also the sheer richness of it and the importance of getting into the detail of the dynamics of individual businesses, the issues they face, and how different they are. Um, the UK economy is a very rich, diverse, complex economy with lots and lots of different sorts of business. Um, and that's why I think the judgment on impact is really hard to make. Um, John has one perspective um, on it. I think if you talk to other manufacturers, say, in, in the auto industry or people who have very integrated supply chains, that they've built over a long time through the EU single market, um, they would have a rather different perspective. But there are undoubtedly some companies, you know, there are undoubtedly many companies for which what you say is absolutely true, that it'll have a relatively limited impact. But I think there's a very broad spectrum. I think the other thing that's really difficult to know is how the interaction between one thing going on and another thing is going to happen. And I was struck reflecting on your remarks about um, veterinary inspections. Because one of the other things we learned from one of the other interviews we did was that almost all the vets in the Food Standards Agency are non-British. They're all sort of Spanish or Romanian or something. Because apparently, we don't produce that many vets. And all our vets go, like to go into small animal veterinary services. So basically all the vets in the food. So you have this issue of we're going to have a massive demand potentially for many, many new vets and yet the only place we're going to get them from is Europe. Um, and, and that kind of 
um, interaction between... I, I suspect there's a lot of that going on here, which is that there will be kind of uninf unexpected interactions between one aspect of Brexit and another, um, which could make it quite um, uh, challenging to manage. Um, but the main point I wanted to um, make was simply to say th this is the level and detail of discussion we need to be having. R sometimes when you read the kind of high-level rhetoric, um, it misses the point that each t sector, each type of business, we, and we could have put a completely different, we could have put a, an AI business, a biotech business, um, you know, a theater producing business, and you would have heard a completely different set of issues um, uh, coming up. But we need to be dealing with those. That's the policy challenge. Lovely, right, okay, it's time to open it up to the audience. Uh, we've got about 25 minutes. Uh, can I have uh, a name? Can I have an affiliation? Can I have a question? Uh, and we've got some roving mics. Uh, this lady at the front here, you know, very keen. I like that. Um, and the mic is right there. Uh, hello, I'm Antoinette Haig, uh, King's College Political Economy Masters. John. Oh, John. I know you so well. <laughs> I, you know, you, you said that you have something to say about policy. Well, say something about policy instead of name dropping Michelle Barnier um, and name dropping EU politics and sort of disregarding everything else that everyone else on the panel has said. Um, you know, we've heard from uh, our colleague here from the uh, Meat, uh, sorry, from the Meat um, Trade Association, right? Um, very specific numbers about how meat uh, prices will be affected, how imports and exports will be affected. And, and you've, you've brushed that aside. So if you have something to say about policy that you know so much better than all these other businesses, then say something. I would like to say something about uh, food oh. prices and agriculture. Oh. I mean, one of the, one of the issues that uh, uh, really is going to have to be faced up is whether if we come outside the customs union, we're going to maintain anything similar to the common agricultural policy. I mean, you're probably aware of the fact that before we joined the, what was then the common market, we had much lower food prices than, uh, relatively speaking, we've got now because we had a deficiency payment system rather than uh, levies and, and very high tariffs, which we've got now. I mean, it's the possibility of bringing tariffs right down, as, the, as they did, for example, in, in New Zealand, uh, with very substantial welfare benefits for poorer people. Now, uh, that would be potentially quite disruptive for the agricultural industry. And I'm sure you'd have to go on with some sort of support like the uh, system we had previously updated to uh, where we are now. But I, mean, I think the, the options that are uh, available for doing this sort of thing are very substantial. I mean, you, just on, on the food uh, side, I mean, it, it, we, we actually get about a quarter of our food. I think I'm right in saying that about 50% of our food is produced in the UK. About 20, I think it's about 25%. It's, it's, I, thought, I had a look at the figures, I thought it was 25, anyway, 25 to 30 percent, but there's about 25 percent that comes from the rest of the world. And food prices in the world are much cheaper than they are in the European Union. And, you know, there is a real policy question about whether we ought to take advantage of that. There's, there's, um, there's no doubt that what John says is in principle right. And... Uh, we have a third paper which we're working on at the moment, looking in particular at the UK-US um, relationship and what kind of free trade agreement you might have there. I mean, there, there's no doubt that um, the British services sector would love to be able to have access into the American financial services market, um, and the US agricultural industry would love to have access into the British food market. Um, and... The problem is that the U.S. has um, its revealed preference has been never to allow any access um, to any other country's financial services into the U.S. And we could import cheaper American food, and we would probably make a saving relative to the amount we spend on the common agricultural policy. But it would be interesting to know what impact that would have on British farming and the British meat industry, because I think probably it's not only that it would be disruptive. I mean, I think it probably would be decimating, wouldn't it? Not what's happened in New Zealand. No, but I'm talking about the, I'm talking about the US, which is, um, which is, which is, which is the, the, the talked about free trade agreement. But actually, 
Um, you couldn't strike that deal unless you had a substantial change in regulatory standards. And um, the impact upon the British farming industry and the British meat industry would be um, very substantial indeed. And the question is, is that actually a deal we would be willing to do? Or do we end up saying to the Americans, actually, we don't want a free trade agreement in agriculture and we'd much rather carry on um, with the current kind of subsidies we pay, in which case um, we don't get the upside from the consumer point of view. All we have is the downside side of our exporters who suddenly find it very hard to sell into, into European markets. And so you are right in principle, but actually, do you think practically, do you think when you're talking to Mr. Barnier, does he really think we're going to do an agricultural deal with America? Well, it's not just America. I mean, there's food available all over the world at cheap prices. Can we hear from the meat specialist about the meat products, please? Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. We will, we will no barracking for the audience, please. I can see a question right at the back. I'm going to stand there so I can see the questions. Right at the back, please. Uh, Matthew Jackson. Uh, I'm a director of an EdTech startup here in the UK a lot of export throughout the world. The OECD talks about education being one of our greatest exports in this, uh, this country. Um, talking about the softer side of regulation, so particularly on GDPR, we've spent an awful lot of money as a business over the last 18 months getting ourselves in a position for GDPR. I just wondered the expectation is not just about exports and tariffs, but actually how we as businesses set ourselves up to pay for things that will realistically make sure that we can compete on a European level as well as a global level, uh, and what impact that's having on business. So Brexit is going to be a, a big consideration. Things like GDPR, when they come into force, when they're being affected, as of this year in, in May, will impact us as much as the Data Protection Act that was updated last year. And even in May 2019, uh, we'll be under the same regulation for GDPR to ensure that anybody that's uh, an EU uh, citizen, regardless of whether we're a member of the European Union or not, are still protected by GDPR as well as the Data Protection Act here in the UK. Thank you. Who would like to answer that one? One of the business panel? Okay. No? Fine. We will move on. Okay, this man down the front here, please. Hello, my name's Tony Doyle. I'm a, <coughs> a manufacturer of domestic electronic equipment. Um, I was very interested to hear the comments from our five commentators. Uh, I would hazard a guess that four of them uh, would like to remain in the EU. Um, but John, in particular, was very vociferous and would like to, is glad that we're going to leave the EU. But what was very interesting is from the four people who I'm hazarding <laughs> want to remain, um, uh, talked about the, uh, the, the um, detrimental effects of leaving. Whereas the person who was very for leaving said it probably won't make much difference if we uh, leave. And if I was to, were to take um, the five comments as a, um, statistically, I would say it's very, very much um, important that we stay in completely in the EU. That's my um, assessment of these comments. Thank you. Does anyone want to comment on that? As well. <laughs> We do need some questions, okay? <laughs> One question right down the front here. Martin, there we go. Um, I want to ask, I'm oh, sorry, I'm Penny Andrews. I'm a postdoc at the University of Leeds and a PhD student at the University of Sheffield because I like to keep myself busy. I, I previously worked on uh, an EU-funded research project of lost colleagues due to all the Brexit uncertainty. And also my husband was made redundant due to Brexit and thankfully got redeployed. I want to know how we can reduce the polarity in this debate, the hard polarity in this debate, so we can actually have conversations about these details that we've been talking about tonight. Because at the moment it feels in the media, as we know from Ed's interview this morning on the Today programme, but also in my conversations. I grew up in a, I grew up in a rural area, 
uh, in Yorkshire, and the cities, most of the cities apart from Sheffield, voted to remain, but all the farmers voted to leave, and it's very difficult to have conversations with people where I grew up about how all this is going to work, because people are either cheerleading for one side or the other, so I'd like to ask the panel about that. Please, yes, Isaac. Uh, it's an interesting point you raise about the, uh, the fact that perhaps most of the farmers voted leave, actually, during the run-up to, uh, to the vote, one of the strongest uh, arguments for leave came from uh, my partner's grandfather, who used to be a dairy farmer. And the decline in the industry, in the dairy industry, uh, which he attributes to uh, the European Union and the CAP, was quite convincing and quite strong. Uh, and it's very interesting also, uh, now that I'm working in a sector that supplies into that kind of industry, the dairy industry, and monitoring the trend in the industry, we're seeing a, a slow but steady uh, recovery in the industry. And y you do wonder if they're, they're sort of seeing a, a bit of optimism in the chance that the CAP is going to be somewhat changed. Um, but it, it's a very interesting point, I think. And I think that that's, uh, you know, we've got a lot of concerns uh, about the future after Brexit, but to me, uh, the re-emergence of a, a strong dairy industry in the UK would be a, a definite pro to Brexit. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Thank Please, sorry. yeah. Sorry. Also, to sort of answer the previous gentleman's sort of point, um, actually, as a trade association, we didn't take a view because our members have a variety of different views. Some see great opportunities with future free trade agreements and others have a different perspective. Um, I think in terms of moving forward po post the sort of po polarity, I think we need to get down to the details and actually start addressing some of these big questions around, for us, things like tariffs and veterinary, veterinary checks. And that's how we need to move forward with a constructive sort of dialogue on those sorts of issues. We were, I think Penny was talking about the high-level political discussion. Um, but then, as Peter said, there's all these very detailed, granular points. How much... Uh, I think we'd all like to believe that behind the scenes, there's a really, really detailed conversation going on involving between the government and also your association or companies who know what they're talking about to try and map out the answers to these very detailed, difficult questions. And I just wondered whether that was true or how advanced this is. Are we still at the very early stage of discussions or sector by sector or area by area? Are you actually now getting into the real detail with um, departments? Um, so I'd say we, we have been engaging with government since the referendum because we've got these sort of big questions for our sector and we've provided a lot of input. Um, and I think we're starting to have more of a dialogue um, but that's probably only just sort of starting. And I mean, a lot of things are up for negotiation and therefore it's quite difficult um, for us to get into the nitty gritty. Who's got the next question? Wow, there we are. Okay, I'll have that man right there, please. Yeah, I'm uh, Stan Bowden. I'm a founder and CEO of a startup company. We're building autonomous driving technology. Um, so my question really is, uh, has any of the panel recently met Jeremy Corbyn? And uh, would they have a view as to whether we could possibly ever persuade him that we remain in the single market and customs union? <laughs> Panel, have you met Jeremy Corbyn, basically? No, I haven't. I have, I, mean, I have to say, I think he, he, his, his performance through this has been an absolute disgrace. Um, I think he's shown no leadership, not what let other people make mistakes, uh, or there's, there's no a lot of political upside in getting trying to get these things done, so just sitting on the side, doing, no doing nothing at all, trying to get political capital out of doing nothing, I think it's been a disgrace. Well, I've not met him either. <laughs> um, but, but I'm going to defend him. I actually think, um, in the end, the government's the government and the opposition is the opposition. And there's a negotiation. And it's really hard for people who are in opposition to start an alternative negotiation. Um, I think, secondly... Jeremy Corbyn and Keir Starmer took the view from the beginning that you had to accept the referendum result and work out how to make Brexit work rather than saying we reject the referendum result. And that's been their position. I don't think politically they had any option at all but to take that view. They then said what we would seek to do is have the closest relationship we can have 
in order to get the best outcome in terms of growth and jobs, which they said early on for the transition meant um, that they would like to keep the status quo through the transition, customs union and single market, and that includes free movement. They then said that um, they, would like a, uh, they would like to have something as close as possible to the single market, consistent with the fact there would have to be new controls on migration. So that would be their starting point in terms of the negotiation. And on the customs union, um, I don't, it's, it's, it's still evolving as far as I can see, but I think Labour gets quite close to saying they would like to stay in something close to or very similar to or the same as the customs union, certainly a customs union. Whether that is quite the policy for the future, I'm not sure. quite sure, but I would say it's 90% there. So would, they would like um, a deal which is good for growth and jobs in a customs union with as close as possible single market market relationship consistent with changes on migration. The only reason you can really object to that, I would say, is if you think we should have the full single market a la Norway, which is quite complicated in sovereignty terms, or you think we should just reverse a referendum. And it's a perfectly legitimate thing to do, to say, I voted Remain, and therefore I don't like the referendum result. But it's quite hard to do that if you are the leader of a political party in a democracy, when lots of people who voted for you voted Leave and Remain, and in which there's been a fall in respect for politicians, because people think politicians don't respect the democratic process. So I think you have to be quite careful um, in this. If in the end you're saying, well, Jamie Corbyn should say, I disagree with the referendum, that's a really legitimate point of view, but I don't think he can take that point of view. Uh, I, think, I think you'd be better at articulating his position than he has. Hi, I'm a relationship director for um, HSBC in the mid-market, and um, during this time, I guess our focus would be on supporting our clients through this uncertainty, but do we think that the government are going to put some kind of scheme to support businesses and lending through an uncertain time? And I guess that's probably a question for Ed, whether he thinks that's something that's likely to happen. Well, I think the... Um, it all depends how long the transition is and what the transition is, um, and what the end state is. I think if, um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if the end state is a significant departure from um, where we are today, in which there'll be winners and losers. I think there'll be huge pressure on the government to do something to cushion the blow for losers. Think of that in terms of um, agriculture, for example, which is why I think it's, you know, as we say in the paper, um, the idea that there is a big pot of savings uh, to be had through this process, the danger is it ends up, for a period, costing more money um, because, um, for precisely that reason, that you have to do some compensation. Whether, whether in particular, access to credit is an um, issue as opposed to compensating losers, uh, I don't know the answer to that. It may be that you have a better idea um, than me because you're closer to that um, world. Do we think that um, it will be harder in general for small and medium-sized businesses to access credit because of uncertainty? Um, the government has put in place over the last years, um, since the financial crisis and before, um, ways in which it attempts to subsidise and provide concessionary credit. So there's, there's a mechanism to do so. But it would be interesting to know from you whether you think there will be a greater demand from that. Is this... Is this going to be an area where, where, the, where, where things bite? Um, I, think that it, I think that schemes like the Enterprise Finance Guarantee Scheme and, um, and other schemes like that have been really helpful in the past in supporting smaller businesses where they don't have access to security. And I think in times of uncertainty, then certainly it's really difficult for us to make a positive decision because we don't know what's going to happen. And I think from that point of view, something from the government would, I think, and this is just me speaking personally, as a, as a lender, I think that would be useful. Thank you. 
uh, Tom Robinson, the House Commons. Um, in the wake of the referendum in Manchester or the uh, Greater Manchester uh, City region, um, Sir Richard Lease and Sir Howard Bernstein set up or adopted a policy of reporting on a monthly basis to the newly formed combined authority uh, on uh, the status of the effect Brexit was having on the region and what the combined authority could do to mitigate any damaging circumstances or any damaging um, effects of Brexit. Um, I noticed in your paper, Ed, that uh, there were, you didn't interview any um, greater Manchester businesses. We so interviewed Leeds, I'm really sorry. Leeds. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong colour rose there, Ed. So my question is this for the panel. Is there a role uh, going forward um, in the Brexit process for regions? And could you perhaps produce a future paper on it? I, I think the short answer is there is a role for regions, not least because... Um, if you look at any of the analysis that's been done on economic impact, including the recent stuff, um, the impact on regions is very, very different, right? And some regions have very different adjustment challenges um, from others. And so you would want um, the local governments to be alert and aware and responding to those challenges. I think the idea of doing um, um, research into that uh, so the differential challenge by regions is a very interesting one. It's a very interesting idea. Uh, I mean, uh, for example, I mean, an interesting question is, um, when we did our first paper a year ago, um, I would say that in general, the, individ the individual businesses which we spoke to didn't really hugely differentiate between the idea of the single market and the idea of customers' union. And they didn't really differentiate between border checks which were about tariffs and border checks which were about regulation. Uh, and that has changed quite a lot over the last year. So um, you have much more spontaneous discussion of the difference. And I would expect there is quite a different regional impact from um, being in or outside the single market and in, in or outside the customs union. And that um, being outside the single market potentially has quite a big impact upon the more financial services heavy southeast. But once services, you, in, yeah. services you, intensive. And service in, in, more generally. Whereas when you go to um, areas where there's a great extension of manufacturing, in those areas, the um, customs union become more acute. Uh, and it would be interesting to know if that's true. Right, we've got time for one more. I hope this man doesn't do anything about the water. Thanks. Um, I'm an accountant in the uh, mainly in the creative industries. Um, I'm just interested that the, the, the number one concern was, was EU staff, actually. And, and given this was a referendum where um, migration was probably the biggest issue, I mean, the, the research has shown that. Um, just what, what issues uh, the businesses in the panel have found with staff, whether they, they're going already or they're um, needing help, and um, whether you would think that actually getting out there and explaining how important EU staff are to your businesses would, would not be a bad idea in terms of getting the best deal for, um, from the government. Who would like to answer that one? Well, certainly, our, certainly our staff are, are, are obviously clearly important as we have uh, European uh, staff, um, and uh, we're trying to look after them. Um, I was a particularly upset uh, German who lived, lived here for 30 years. Uh, she went um, off for three years and came back in uh, 2013, um, uh, which means that she can't now apply for citizenship. And she, she doesn't. She, she now doesn't think she'll be able to vote in local elections. So therefore, from being uh, seeing uh, as being an engaged citizen of this country. Uh, she now feels that the country is turning, her, um, turning its back on her. And we've, we've had 30 years of taxes out of her, and indeed, um, uh, in my case, 10 years of good work. So there, we have to be very careful with these people because they will, they will leave because they're not, they're not being shown uh, this uncertainty. Certainly, the people who've worked here for even two or three years are not being told absolutely explicitly what's going on, and that's causing a lot of upset and a lot of concern. And certainly, for the, Generally, in terms of uh, again, diversity, connectedness, um, uh, ideas, having a wide, a wide view and uh, um, a collection of ideas, and indeed languages in, your, in, a, in a creative business is really, really important to us. So any barrier to that is is is, uh, is hard. Um, and so, from a both from a personal level and a professional level, um, we're, we're we're fighting against this. I think one of the things we really learnt um, from the 
these interviews is how successful the UK has been across multiple different industries at attracting talent from all over Europe. Um, we've sucked in some very, very capable people. Um, and there is this very practical challenge now of we have all these businesses, and Stan, your business is a good example, 5AI, which is you know real leading edge um, artificial intelligence business. Um, these businesses live or die by whether or not they can attract some of the best talent um, in the world. And I, I think it was you, Stan, who said every interview now with a EU potential employee is a long conversation about Brexit. And because people are committing their lives, they're thinking about their partners, their children, their long-term plans, and it's, it's, it, makes, it makes it very, very difficult. I think, uh, to pick up on that, in a, in a way, I think the, the reason this issue is really interesting is because it, it, it picks up a number of different things which come out of the work we did, but also the nature of the challenge today. So first of all, I would say, in general, we didn't have discussions with businesses saying, in general, um, we want to reverse the decision. We had discussions with businesses saying, okay, well, it's been made, but how's it going to work? And in the case of, um, of migration, as we say in the paper, if most people are accepting, well, okay, there's going to have to be a different regime, but what is the regime going to be? And how is it going to work for seasonal work or um, for particular areas where we need uh, expertise? And the uncertainty, because at the moment there's no framework at all, makes it very, very hard. The second thing is that it particularly depends on particular issues for particular sectors. We had a really interesting discussion with the Creative Industries Federation about the, um, the nature of London as a fashion centre and the role models play. But the issue is, can models get work permits? I'm the chairman of a football club. We don't know what this is going to mean for um, the way in which um, mm. people will get work permits in a year's time. <coughs> Vets at the border. I mean, there is so many different areas where, as well as the general point, specifically, you have a particular need for particular kind of labour in a particular way, which is not necessarily people coming here to work for 10 years, but it's actually meeting a particular demand at a particular time. And the third thing is that it's impacting now. And that is particularly true with um, the migration uh, issue. The uncertainty, there's some areas where people are thinking, I want to plan ahead. What will we do in a year's time or two years' time or three years' time? But as you get the feeling at the moment, businesses feel that it is, um, it is now harder to access talent. Um, or to make plans, because people are thinking, well, if I don't know what the regime's going to be next year, I'll think twice about whether this is the right place to come this year. So the idea that this is all about um, an impact in one, two, three, five years' time, uh, there was a very powerful point which a number of people said to us, which is, we feel as though um, we're kind of retreating a bit from Europe, and our counterparts kind of think we're already retreating a bit from them. And that sense happening now, I mean, this is not global Britain, this is potentially the opposite. And the migration area is it, just an area where the government needs really quickly, I think, um, to try and give some, some uh, in my personal view, I think there's no possibility of uh, Britain continuing with free movement. Uh, but I think everybody thinks, pretty much everybody thinks that migration um, and people coming to work in a country from abroad play a really important role. And we want to know how this is going to work in practice. And um, I know it's really hard because it's quite strongly different views, but we need a bit of clarity. Time for clarity. He should go into politics, shouldn't he? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, that brings us to an end of the 26th strain group. Uh, the next one, in a month's time, we have. Uh, Stephen Lovegrove, the Permanent Secretary to the Ministry of Defence, is going to talk about future challenges. So that one might be quite spiky as well. Um, apologies to those who still wanted to ask questions, but the panel will be around. The drinks are over there, and you'll get your chance then. All that's left for me to say after, I think, a very um, uh, informative evening is a big thank you to uh, John Mills, uh, to Isaac, to Katie, to Will, to Sue, to Ed. Thank you very much indeed.